Hello and welcome to the first episode of Plant Based Bros with Jeff Palmer and me, Jason Demchuk. Jeff is a bodybuilder, a plant based fitness nutrition company founder, and amazing scholar. I'm a whole food plant based chef and a holistic health educator, and we're both lifelong seekers of truth, beauty, and goodness. Together, we will discuss the latest, most reliable research that continues to show that the most delicious, healthiest, and affordable food is also the most compassionate to the earth and living beings. This show is dedicated to you and all beings, and also the stars of this show, the plants. What's up, bro? How you doing? Hey, good to see you, my friend. <laughs> so excited to be talking to you. You always present the cutting edge research on cadaverine, putrazine, which we're going to have some fun talking about today. Things I've never heard of um, besides from you. But what I'm really excited to talk about is this concept, which I just learned from you a couple of weeks ago, that unlike herbivores, we don't have the enzyme to break down cellulose. And just like carnivores, we don't, or unlike carnivores, I should say, we don't have the stomach acids and the and the giant stomach to break down meat. But instead, we have something which I believe you said is unique to humans, which is we've outsourced mm -hmm. our digestion to a ridiculously dense and diverse microbiome. So we have the choice to what I call inner composting. We feed, we eat food and that food feeds the bacteria that like the food. So there's some bacteria that loves fiber. So if we, if we eat a lot of fiber foods, they're gonna proliferate in our gut and that's gonna have drastic uh, downstream implications in our overall health. Whereas if we're eating meat and fish, and animal products, we're going to be compost, a different type of compost and breeding a whole different microbiome ecosystem, operating system, which again is going to have very drastic implications. So we're not even gonna be talking about what macronutrients you get from plants or animals. We're talking today on our first episode about the two different, it's almost like being, <laughs> I'm not going to say two different species. That's why I call it like an operating system, but it literally does affect your mood as well. The type of bacteria. So it's going to affect your mental state, your health. But did I do a good job of setting that part up so far? Anything you want to add to that? Sure. I think the, what we got to understand, because, you know, uh, I, I know the uh, anti-vegan crowd will say uh, human beings have, have lost the enzyme to digest cellulose. And it's not that we lost it. We actually still have the gene. The gene is turned off in humans. Now, in our paleontology, we have found that earlier humans, earlier hominins, but homo sapiens still, had that at gene activated. Um, so they were, we humans were just like other herbivores digesting fiber ourselves through our own production of the cellulase enzyme. Um, so it's interesting that we have a latent gene. We have the gene to produce the enzyme and our body is choosing not to. Now, why would that be? <laughs> okay. Um, so why would humans be different than um, uh, other herbivores? Well, you got ruminant herbivores, which are grazers, grass eaters, like cows and sheep and, and stuff like that. And then you've got the more mixed bag that are eating berries or nuts or whatever plant material that you could find, which is more like human beings. But human beings developed a real broad spectrum in our diet. So not just grasses or leaves, um, which are much more high in cellulose, but also fruits and nuts and seeds and tubers and other sources that have different fibers, different nutrients to, to uptake. So our microbiome gained diversity. It's interesting in the uh, recent um, uh, anthropological studies showed they had um, teeth, they measured the teeth 
of both Neanderthals, which is uh, uh, lived at the same time as modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, and Homo sapiens living at the same time. And both of them had a uh, dead my oral microbiome in their teeth, in the plaque in their teeth, because they died with plaque on their teeth, and that calcified. Well, they could identify by the DNA what our oral microbiome was. And the number one most prevalent oral microbiome bacteria was a starch eating bacteria. So we were predominantly starch eating. We're eating tubers and, and onions and root vegetables and um, starchy vegetables like squashes and things like this that were accessible and that we could store for a long time and carry with us as we traveled. So it made a lot of sense. You can carry around potatoes for months, a year and a year, and you probably still eat it and get nutritional value out of it. Obviously cooking it gave it even more and released even more. They say now that's probably what caused it because our brain is a sugar machine. <laughs> it functions almost solely on glucose. Um, actually about 25% of our entire intake of glucose goes directly to our brain. Um, so uh, it's a glucose hog. Um, and because of that, we need, in order to get bigger brains, the only way we could do that is to increase the amount of glucose. Well, what is the highest in glucose per, per gram? And that's starches. Starches have a thousand uh, glucose molecules stuck together. So it's really condensed form, whereas fruit is simple and much fewer. Even though we taste sweet uh, to our tongue, it's actually a lot less glucose than um, cooked uh, tubers. Or yeah, People don't realize like you could eat a whole orange and it's like 45 calories. <laughs> exactly. Even though it tastes so sweet and people are worried about carbs, but you could eat a whole like pint of strawberries and it's it's like about the same, like 50 calories. Exactly. And the and the cooked tubers, the starches or starchy vegetables, they'll release that in a slow and steady space. So you're not spiking insulin or anything like that. And the brain can get this steady source of glucose to feed itself. So, all right. So real clear what we were eating. Um, our The measurement of our poop, fossilized human poop, showed we were eating about 100 to 200 grams of fiber every day, every day. <laughs> so, and probably more than that, because that was just measured in a single poop. If they're making, if you're eating a lot of fiber, you know, you can poop two or three times a day. Um, so, so, uh, so are, are the other animals that are ruminants, other herbivores, they're not eating the diversity that we were, they weren't, they, they wouldn't be eating fruits. How about like an orangutan or like a gorilla? Exactly. Let's take a, let's take a gorillas. About 80 to 90% of their diet are leaves. So, they're what they call folivores. They eat foliage. Mm -hmm. um, they do consume some nuts and fruits when they're available, and but fruits are available seasonal, so they can only eat them for a couple of months. And while they're ripe, you know, <laughs> the rest of the time they're not ripe or not available. So predominantly, they get their their source of energy from folivores, and 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 almost all of the primates are either folivores or frugivores, which is a more fruit dominant uh, source. Now, remember fruits can come in a lot of things that people don't consider fruits, uh, cucumbers, tomatoes, uh, squashes, peppers. Those are all fruits. Avocados. Uh, avocados, yeah. These are fruits that people don't, people only think of fruits as sweet stuff, but no, there's a, a whole bunch of vegetables that fall into that category. So there, there's some there's some primates that eat mostly fruit, but you, are they available or all year round, you're saying, that, that some of them can in certain regions? Well, that's why they're living in tropical environments mm -hmm. dominantly, because once it gets cold, the, uh, the plant can't produce fruit. But some, some uh, plants do produce fruit, like there are mango trees that produce mangoes year round. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, you know, uh, banana trees in a tropical environment can produce much more uh, longer periods of, of fruit. And then they can go from different fruits and fruits and then supplement with some plants and, and some. So, so like you're saying that uh, most animals, most primates, even they're, they're not eating the diversity that humans started eating. And Correct. because of that, that resulted in us developing this microbiome? Is that because we were eating such diverse things? We were requiring different bacteria to break down all these different foods? 
Correct. Mm. We have over 60,000 different enzymes produced by our microbiome <laughs> to break down just about anything you can throw at it. Um, almost no other animal has the complexity or, or diversity of the microbiome. So our body realized, hey, wait a minute. Um, we're now able, because of our mobility, because of our diverse spectrum of diet, we've got over 300,000 plants that we can consume. Um, so we've, we've got this amazing diversity where most other animals focus on certain foods stay in that climate, stay in that area, and just eat those foods over and over and again, because they know it, it's consistent, it's easy. Mm -hmm. But human beings are like more curious, bigger brains. Because of that addition of starchy vegetables to our diet, we were able to feed more glucose to our brain. So our brain was allowed to grow. And our bigger brains said, hey, let's figure out more things to eat. This eating thing is fun. <laughs> I like this different tastes of different fruits and different vegetables. And so, and, and our ability to, to freely migrate and travel even to places that didn't supply very much in food and still survive was, was really a uh, unique thing to our species. Um, but this gave us the ability to have this amazingly diverse and complex microbiome. Interestingly, there uh, are estimated slightly over a thousand different types of bacteria that live in our gut. I, I heard 30,000. Uh, and and the, there's very variants all around. Now, types of okay. bacteria. I heard 35,000 uh, different species in a healthy human gut. From and and that, that could be true too as well. Some estimates are 400 species. But if you include, it depends on how you're phrasing it. If you're right. just including bacteria, it may be around 1,000. If you include yeasts, funguses, okay. and things like this, right. yes, it's probably in the 35,000 range. But you look at the bacteria number in number of species, and it's very similar to the number of different types of cells in the human body. Mm. When you look at the total count out of all the species, and actually the total count of the species, it's about 40 trillion by most estimates, right. which is about the exact same number as the human body. So same number in variety and same number in total count. So it's like we have this second person living inside of us. I, I like to say, you know, we're just the host. Like yes. we're going around feeding them if we do things right. And if we feed them, they reward us. Yes. Serotonin. So I want to actually, I mean, we, we could stay on this topic for a long time, but that's this is amazing. But let's talk about, actually, let, let's wrap it up. So by eating the starches and having this diversity, that's what caused us to um, to for that gene to go dormant because we started getting all these bacteria. So, okay, let's just actually say one more step back. We're eating different plants. It's going in, it, fiber doesn't break down in our stomach, the first place of our digestive system or our small intestine. That's breaking down proteins and and it's, it's denaturizing the proteins into amino acids and it's uh, emulsifying the fats, right? So we could absorb fat, but then whatever doesn't get digested, all these different fibers go into the colon where they're broken down. Is that correct? Uh, that is what they used to think. We, okay. now, know, <laughs> we now know that uh, that digestion actually does start taking place in the upper GI. Um, With the microbiome. Yes. Now, predominantly, a lot of the short chain fatty acid production does happen in the colon out of waste products, but it's more measurable there because the body isn't using it as rapidly or uptaking it as rapidly. So if you have a small amount that's happening, that could be taken up by cells immediately, mm. and then it's not measurable. So that is where that assumption led to. Gotcha we had to look at, it's called um, microgenomics. When we started looking at the DNA that was being used, we did see them producing enzymes that would convert them to usable energy, but the energy was being used up before it even got to the colon, so there wasn't a way to measure that up until recently with mm -hmm. new um, uh, 
data. So there, and, there, but I, there still is more bacteria in the colon by, by in quantity, right? Because they. I believe so. Yes. Um, but but like ten to the six. I, I saw it was like ten to the sixteen in like the small intestine, but like ten to the seventeen in the large intestine, which seems like it's pretty close. But that extra sixteen to seventeen is actually a ridiculously high number. Again, this is like Zach Bush stuff I saw a few years back. But when you you look at the uh, transit, <laughs> you've got a, a much longer uh, uh, upper GI than you do the colon, the length of the colon. Mm. Oh, really? Yes, uh, uh, many times longer, and the uh, colon is it's bulbous, but it's by and large more smooth mm. and that creates less surface space, less surface area. When you fold something, now you have more surface area. You have the surface area of a lot more space. It's just like you take a piece of paper. I don't have one. Or you could take a napkin and you fold it. Now you have a lot more surface area and a smaller space. And a small intestine actually has way more, it's more folded up. Way more folded, and, gotcha. and that's why it's all over the place. It's you know, the guts, yeah. Uh, that's it's to create more surface space, so there's more absorption, more area for the body to absorb materials and and break them down too. So, uh, so even the fiber is being broken down. You're saying it's not just breaking down. It's it's so it's so, like another like you know confusion. Like the large intestine is actually smaller than the small intestine, right? <laughs> <laughs> so okay so so that's what caused this shift in, in the human microbiome what makes us different but now let's talk about like so what happens what let's compare these two um you know so if you're eating only plant foods like you have for the last 40 years you are going to have a very different uh Spe uh, you know, uh, ecosystem of all, all these different species and someone who is eating omnivore or, yes. or even, even someone who might be eating plant-based, but eating not high in fiber, eating a lot of processed foods. So let's start with, um, I guess like the, so see what's different. I know that we could go into like short chain fatty acid production. We could yeah. talk about, um, the harmful things from like the, the, the cadaverine, the TMAO. So why don't you just like, yes, yeah, wherever you want to start with, what's the difference between the microbiome of someone who's eating predominantly all or predominantly plants, or actually let's do all three. Someone who's eating exclusively plants, someone who's eating maybe like 80% plants and someone who's eating like 50% or less. Okay, so let's uh, start at the, kind of at the beginning here. The reason our body did that was because it realized it had a symbiotic relationship with uh, the microbiome. It said, hey, wait a minute, you're producing metabolites that we, we can't eat through our own digestion process. And, you know, uh, some estimates up to 70% or more of our digestion actually happens by our gut bacteria. So, Instead of the human being wasting energy creating and wasting resources, proteins, because all enzymes are proteins, right. you're burning up a lot of proteins and making them when, wait a minute, your bacteria can do that for you yourselves. Well, geez, I can free up all that protein for building muscle, for you know, uh, human growth, for uh, keeping our body uh, filled and stuff. So it's efficiency of calories, efficiency of building materials, um, and it said, hey, wait a minute, if they're doing it for us and they're producing things that we can't even do, why produce all this? So enzyme, nature, nature loves itself. efficiency. So that's so Total what you're efficiency. Is, e economy if we get of energy. If, if we get outsourced the work, yes, let them do it. And, yes. it came, and, and they benefited because they yes. got to, like I said, we're, we're just walking around feeding them. We're going around. Them. So it's, it became a beautiful, almost perfect symbiotic relationship. Exactly. So we realized, hey, wait a minute, let's turn off the fiber instead of us using that for energy, because we do use it for energy through, through that. So you can, uh, we can produce the enzyme cellulase and break down the fiber into short chain fatty acids which then we can actually use for energy. And our body actually about uh, eight to 10% of our total energy intake comes from short fat chain fatty acids. Um, so that was a good thing. Now, you look at a gorilla 
and up to 40 to 50% of their total uh, energy can come from short chain fatty acids through the fermentation and digestion of fiber. So they're real dominantly heavy on that. So <laughs> when you look at their diet, you say, oh, they're eating no protein or, or, or fats. And as a matter of fact, because of the way they're digesting, <laughs> the vast majority of their, their so energy is coming from fats. Let me ask you real quick. So, but you're saying that they can break, they have the enzymes to break down cellulose, but they also have a microbiome that's producing the butyrate? Correct, even more efficiently. Their colon is even more efficient at uh, fermentation of it than ours is. Uh, and that's because we only need a little bit of that energy. Eight to 10% of our energy comes from short chain fatty acids. The rest come from carbs and starches and protein. We don't have sugars. to eat as, as much of the gorilla. They have to eat Correct. all the So it freed us up to not have to eat so much. Correct, 25 pounds of food in a day. I challenge any human being to try to consume right. 25 pounds of food. That's a lot of leaves to get 25 pounds of leaves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so, okay. So can you explain what short chain fatty acids are to, yeah. to, 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 in a simple way? And and I know you mentioned butyrate. Are there other ones um, important like butyrate? I know there's like acetate, I think is another one, and right? Propionate. Mm -hmm. Propionate. So, so what are they? What, why are they so important? And um, yeah, because they're very important. Great question. They are important for so many things across the, the board. For neuroprotection of our brain, uh, we store a bunch of butyrates. Actually, uh, absorption in our colon, uh, most of it goes straight to our lungs. Mm. Now, why would the body put butyrate next to the lungs? Okay. When you are exposed to a virus or a bacteria or an airborne pathogen, What's the first tissue it hits? The lungs. Exactly. We breathe it in. That's the entry point into our body. Either our mouth from what we're eating or our nose and mouth from breathing in stuff. But that's the fastest and quickest way for a pathogen to get in our body. Obviously, it's where COVID happens, right? A virus. We breathe it in. Okay. So that's why our body actually stores a bunch of butyrate around our lungs. Butyrate helps the body through the immune system produce a cool uh, immunoglobulin called cathelicidin. This is part of our innate system, which destroys pathogens, bacteria, viruses, including, um, including uh, envelope viruses or spiked viruses like COVID. Um, and butyrate plays a big role in producing this, but it also on the back end, Okay, so once we've got this catalyst in there going and destroying all the bacteria, now you've got a battlefield full of inflammation and water accumulation because there's toxins there. So the body pushes a bunch of water in there. That's inflammation. Now, that's actually how many of the people getting COVID died was they drowned in their own fluid in their lungs hmm. because of this big battle going on between our immune system and, and the uh, pathogen. So you need to remove that as quickly as possible so you don't drowned in your own uh, fluids, but also so you get those toxins out of the body so they don't damage healthy tissues. That's where that butyrate comes in again. It pairs and bonds to that and helps reduce the inflammation, carry out those negative particles. Really important for our survival. If that weren't big enough, we found now that they found in a study with uh, mothers while pregnant, those who had the lowest amounts of fiber intake, their children had up to 40 to 50% more learning disabilities, inability to process, inability to recognize things, inability to problem solve, and inability to communicate. 40 to 50% less. So, okay. Just just by the mother consuming less That's plant funny. fiber. So, so let's 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 take a step back. So butyrate. Is a, is a type of short chain fatty acid. So when we eat fiber, fibrous foods, fibers come from beans, from, from plants, only from plants, right? There's no only fiber in cheese or dairy or meat. There's zero fiber in when any animal. Fiber, fiber, it gets into our colon. It, or is, is it only produced in our colon, the butyrate, the short chain fat? Or is that also produced in the, in the small intestine? Mostly in our colon, but also okay. produced. So it's, it's, it's going into our intestines. The bacteria eat the fiber and produce this, this thing called butyrate, which is a fat. Short so, chain fatty acid. Mm -hmm. 
And some of that goes to our brain. Yes. And protects us from diseases like Alzheimer's. It's been starting to be shown. Yes. But most of it goes to our lungs. Yes. So is it a lot of it? A lot of it does, but it also goes to our liver to protect our liver. They've shown it reduce non-alcoholic so fatty it, liver it, disease. It helps, it helps our own body produce this cat. What is it called? Catulatorums? What was that word you used for the for the for the the um the thing it produces part of our innate immune system? The the immune oh catholicidin. Catholicidin, right? So. Yeah. How does the be? I mean, it, it, the butyrate helps produce it. It's like it's it. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so, so our butyrate, body, butyrate, and vitamin D three are integral uh, uh, triggers and producers of catholicidin. Our main, um, uh, one of the main uh, innate immune responses to help us attack and defeat viruses and pathogens. Wow. So, so the body takes this butyrate from our colon and yes. sends it all over the body to the organs, to the yes. lungs. Yes, the and brain, to the liver, the kidneys, to the pancreas to help with insulin regulation, wow. to uh, our cells and uh, our muscle cells to help with uh, a utilization of sugars. It affects our glycemic index. I mean, just like all over the place. It's one of the most important molecules, arguably, right? Like Totally. And, and and is it slimy? Is that how it flushes things out? Is it because it's like oily that it flushes things out or no? Uh, butyrate is a fat. So uh, yeah, remember. And, it's and, that's, and it also, yeah. I, I think most people think of butyrate who know about it, think of it as protecting the colon lining. That's that's like, you didn't even mention that, but that's what most people think of. So it actually, when people talk about leaky gut, and I have a personal experience with this, be, you know, before, before I went plant-based and especially after meeting you, I was under the impression, like many people are misguided, like, oh, I ate beans or I ate this and I got bloated or I had, you know, I was afraid I was reading the plant paradox. So I'm getting more and more afraid of these plants. So I'm thinking, oh, I need, I'm allergic to this. I need to eliminate this. I need to eliminate this. But, um, but then I started, you know, going at, going, eating the plants and what happened, what I understand happened is now the butyrate, since I'm producing so much butyrate, my gut lining is being repaired. Everybody's talking about repairing the gut lining by eliminating plants. It's exactly the opposite. And yes, I did have bloating, probably because of my low carb diet. I wasn't getting enough fiber, so I had I didn't have the bacteria to break it down. That's why it's important if you're if you're like, oh, I can't eat beans without getting sick. Okay, well, don't eat a giant plate of beans. Start eating small amounts so you start to populate. You're composting. You have to. You have to start introducing these things slowly. So, so that's what most people think about butyrate, right? As it, it protects the gut lining as mm -hmm. well. Totally. And it, so there's these uh, cilial cells, the cells that actually help pull in the nutrients from, from our gut mm -hmm. uh, into the bloodstream so that we can utilize them. Um, these cells have junctures in between them. And um, when you feed them, uh, butyrate, they can actually swell and that closes the junctures. Mm -hmm. When they're deprived of butyrate, they can gap and that can lead macro particles, toxins, waste products, putrefied materials to get into the system. And that's where you can have leaky gut syndrome. As a matter of fact, amazing research. So when you eat meat, you can form these tangled proteins, denatured proteins, especially cooked meat. Um, these tangled proteins called tau and beta amyloid proteins, which you probably heard from Alzheimer's, and they're saying, wow, this is where they're produced, but they're produced in the gut and they're too big to get through the gates. But they're not too big because the cadaverines and the putrezine that you're eating are damaging the cells and causing gaps and allowing these big macro tangled proteins to get into the bloodstream. Then so they're going double, to the brain. Double effect from eating the meat. Yes, correct. You're not only creating the actual amyloid and tau plaques that will form the plaques in the brain that cause Alzheimer's disease, but you're giving them the specific pathway by eating meat to get into the bloodstream because the body would normally protect you from doing that. Wow. Yes, it's the double whammy. It's not only the causation, the creation that causes it, but it's the delivery mechanism too. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about that. So, so when you eat meat, uh, yeah. which has carnitine and choline, 
um, or I should, let's just let's just make it simple. Like you're eating meat. Okay, actually, let me let me stop by asking a question. So when we were going around eating different foods, like you know, primates don't eat much meat. Yes, they'll probably eat a little bit of meat, right? And they'll eat ins. I know they'll eat insects, but you know, you, you see these videos of of chimpanzees eating meat, but I'm sure it's very limited, right? It's not it's not the majority of their diet. Less than one percent of their less diet. than one percent, right? Okay, so but we as humans, because of our curiosity and and, and maybe you know, uh, you know. Um, What's the word? Like a disaster, we wound up eating meat somehow. And then is that how we created a, sim a relationship with these meat breaking down bacteria as well? It's not a good relationship. It's, no, a, it's, not. <laughs> it's, a, it's not a symbiotic relationship because the bacteria are producing things that actually harm us. That's not, that's pathogenic. The other thing is bile. So, um, Plants, uh, because of our microbiome, actually break down fairly easily and are non-toxic in their source. Now, we can get into lectins, uh, uh, oxalates, and, and phytates in a second, but let's, uh, before we go there and debunk those three, <laughs> let's, let's talk about what's happening with the meat. Um, uh, so in the early times, even humans, when we ate meat, one, we predominantly at first ate it raw, um, we ate it as scavengers because we were about three and a half, four feet tall. Okay. So we were bigger, we were smaller than most of the animals that were predatory. You know, a lion could catch us very easily. We were easy pickings. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we stayed away from carnivores, except we'd follow them sometimes to try to pick up their sloppy seconds, um, just as an easy source of food that somebody else killed for us. So at the event of tools and stuff, yes, we did learn to catch animals, but look, we're bipedal. Uh, try chasing uh, an antelope. <laughs> See how long that gets you. You're going to end up burning more energy <laughs> trying to chase after an antelope than even throwing a stick at it. Come on, man. <laughs> so, you know, this, this was, we were eating like lizards or uh, maybe a, a baby bunny or something that couldn't run faster than a human could, uh, not major animals, uh, unless we were scavenging. So that was the case. And then we we're eating it only on, the, we were, look, a, a, a root vegetable doesn't run away. Right. We don't have to go too far to find a leaf that we can eat. You right. know, these, these, these are things that don't kill us, uh, don't run away and are more abundant than the animals. Right. <laughs> When you look at the trophic order, you have plants at the very bottom of the pyramid, right? It's it's mostly plants. Mm -hmm. Below that's actually fungi, which are even more dominant than the plants. But it gets smaller in number as you go to the top. Um, and it's because there has to be more food than the animal, or there can't be enough food for the animal. So when people say, oh, what if there's no food there? Well, then there would be no animals there because there'd be no food to feed the animals, mm -hmm. even if it was plants feeding the herbivore that were killed by the lion, if there were only lions and not enough plants, right. there wouldn't be any lions. Right. So, uh, you know, people say, oh, lions are the top carnivore. No, they're the most dependent. They're the first to die off right. when plants go down mm -hmm. because it reduces the number of herbivores, which then would have to reduce the number of carnivores because it's less to, for them to eat. So the basis is... 300 to 600,000 plants that are edible. Mm -hmm. Herbivores are much better positioned to survive, mm -hmm. to be able to have a food source that doesn't go away, especially in warm climate areas. So uh, carnivores are the worst, least adapted uh, so, species. So when, <laughs> when we ate meat though, is that how we started to get these enzymes or these bacteria, which we'll talk about cadaverine, which allowed us to start breaking these down. I mean, I, I mean, a baby human can eat meat and break it down. So we still have, I guess we have remnants of these meat br breaking down bacteria, whereas an herbivore would, would probably get sick if it was eating meat. So good question. Um, yes, we do adapt, human beings do adapt. One of the adaptations is producing bile. So if we don't have the bacteria to, to do that, like an infant, which predominantly don't, uh, other than dairy, because they're drinking mm -hmm. mother's milk, um, they produce bile. 
So that's produced by the liver and then goes into there. It's really strong acid to break down that thing. Now, bile kills our friendly bacteria, our good microbiome bacteria. So you don't want a lot of that in your system. Temporarily, not a big deal. You'll wipe out a trillion or two of your bacteria, but they'll you put some more plants in there and they'll repopulate and you're good to go. It's doing that on a regular basis. You create a bile environment in the gut because you're constantly biling the <laughs> system. And that bile allows for bile resistant bacteria, which are pathogenic bacteria. Okay, so this, so so you're saying uh, interesting. So the plant, the, the 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 fiber eating bacteria you get from eating plants will those, die in a bile environment. Well, I was gonna say those are are um, adaptive to us in in the sense that they break down cellulose. But the bacteria that we don't want, which you'll talk about now, like from from the animal. Those come not to break down the meat because we have the bile to do that, but they're just a result of eating meat, the cadaverine and the putrezine. We don't need those to necessarily break down the meat, you're saying. You're saying that by creating a bileless environment, we are now allowing putrezine, cadaverine, and the other one that you mentioned that breaks down the T that, that produces TMA. Yes. So those uh, are not necessarily the interesting. So, yeah. So uh, we have these bacteria because we breathe them. They're on the surface. I mean, they're they're exposed to us. Uh, that's why we can get sick and wipe out our bacteria and have diarrhea and flush all our bacteria. And then within a couple of days, we can have a full bloom of bacteria. One, our, our uh, uh, what's it uh, called? Uh, the thing that people get removed Oh, oh, the gallbladder. Uh, uh, the, something that ruptures, the uh, appendix. Oh, appendix, right, right. Uh, appendix is a little sac at the end of, right before our uh, a large colon starts, that houses a backup supply and then closes. Mm -hmm. So if anything toxic or bacterial wipes out our microbiome, it'll open back up and release that uh, <laughs> Like a little prebiotic. It's like a probiotic little supplement it's, built in. It's into a backup it. drive, backup hard drive uh, for our microbiome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then when you see people having appendicitis, it's because bad bacteria have gotten into that and um, damaged that area. So it can't close, it can't seal, and allows bad bacteria. Uh, sepsis is, is another form of this where this bad bacteria starts to take over. So, and then, so what happens? What happens when we eat? animal products what okay happens? so let's let's do something that to me was as clear as could be so really great study on um atherosclerosis and we now know well we actually knew all the way back in 1908 when it was first proven that oxidated uh ldl cholesterol from our diet is causally related to atherosclerosis which is which is which leads to heart attack stroke uh, uh, heart attack, stroke, uh, high blood pressure, hypertension, uh, dementia in the brain. Mm -hmm. It's basically, it gets inside of our endothelium and then closes down our blood vessels, okay. right? blood vessels in every part of our body. You know, So depending on where it's in, if it's in your genitals, it's erectile dysfunction. If it's in your brain, it's dementia. So it's basically just closing up the ability for blood to reach certain areas. Correct. And we yeah. know that's connected to oxidized cholesterol, cholesterol. which right. means that the cholesterol gets rusted almost, right? It, it gets it Correct. gets it gets rusted oxidized. from from the oxidation from heat. From um, heat. Okay. So by and large, remember, humans were eating animals, or animals were eating animals fresh. Okay, right. raw, where that was not oxidized cholesterol. Some of it was oxidized. The oxidation starts to happen immediately after death. So another reason why humans wouldn't want to eat an animal after long after death, um, one, because of the bacteria, two, because the putrezines and cadaverines could cause cancer. That's why they smell repulsive to human beings to tell That's our why, beings, so stay we, away from that shit. So we, we learned, <laughs> our, or just we learned, our, we evolved like, like other animals that if an animal, when we smell a dead animal, it's one of the worst smells in the world. Everybody knows that. 
Yes. So when you see an animal that's been there, what, in the sun for like a day, it's going to start stinking, like the worst possible smell. So that's caused, so our bodies recognize these bacteria called putrazine, yes. which is what breaks down a dying body. Correct. And, and, and so it's intuitively, just like we're drawn to a beautiful color of a blueberry or, or a mango and the sweet taste. And we're repulsed. It's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're repulsed by rotting meat. One hundred percent. And remember, meat begins to rot within ten minutes and up to thirty minutes, depending on the animal or situation. Mm -hmm. So it immediately starts to rot, and you don't even get it to the grocery store to pick it up usually for at least a few days, and sometimes weeks, if not longer. Okay. Um, so you are getting a fully rotted. They even gas the meats mm -hmm. to kill the browning so you won't see the rotting situation of the putrazines that are in there. It doesn't mean they're not there. It just means it. And then you cook them so that you can no longer smell the putrazines. Otherwise, we'd never get it past our nose. Right. Um, you know, same with the TMAO in fish. TMAO is what gives fish its fishy smell. <laughs> Most people are repelled by that fishy smell. Ooh. How do like people... How do people there's people who like the fishy smell. Is that is that just some type of conditioning? Like, how do people get over that? I always hated the fishy smell. I needed to get like when I ate fish. Like, it was always work for me to get fish down. I had to put butter on it and sauce and everything and soy sauce. Correct. And remember, cooking it changes that. Oh, okay. and that's, that's what does that. Mm -hmm. If you actually took a fish and let it sit out in the sun for a few hours, and then had to eat it raw you probably would not do that. <laughs> I don't care who you are. <sighs> yeah. It that's, would why they, that's why they freeze the sushi like right away, right? On the ship. And then it's, it's it's you know, sauced and it's right. cooked right. and it's even raw sushi. There, it's specific types of fish mm -hmm. and then they freeze or refrigerate it to, right. to, to tone down that smell. Because when you heat something, it liberates the molecules that are in it. And then you get more of a smell of it too. So if what, it was so warm, what's, so you wouldn't the, do that. What's the, what's the harm that these bacteria, like putrazine, what does it do to us? Why, why don't we want to have it? Why, or how does it cause um, the, the heart, heart disease and all types of diseases? Putrazine and cadaverine are known carcinogens. Okay. So they are known to cause cancer. You can just type them in and you'll see tons of studies saying, Stay, keep these in limited amounts in your diet. <laughs> well, you just, how about none? <laughs> I mean, there, there's some in, in lots of different things, but, you know, keeping them to a minimum. And remember, plants have antioxidants, mm -hmm. anti-inflammatory. They have butyrates production from the fiber, anti-inflammatory. They have uh, polyphenols, which are prebiotics too as well, anti-inflammatory. Now, polyphenols are only found in plants, mm -hmm. only come from plants. So what, what happens if someone, what if someone was um, saying, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to be an omnivore. I'm going to get all those benefits, but I'm still going to eat some meat. They're producing the cadaverine still, right? Yes. Now, here's an interesting study that they did kind of in that frame. So DHA, which is an omega-3, that only comes from animals. Plants don't make it. They make the, the only essential omega-3 called ALA. Now our body can convert it down to DHA, but only when and where and in the specific tissues that we need it. If you take preformed DHA, which is only found in animal products. So ALA and EPA are both known to be cardioprotective. But when you add DHA preformed from an animal, you cancel out and nullify the beneficial effects of EPA and ALA. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not only that, you inhibit the body's ability to produce more. So you mm -hmm. block the good stuff. So you take away all the benefits and then you block any more benefits from coming just by consuming that animal source DHA. This is why I really recommend to people do not consume algae DHA because you're mimicking the bad effects mm -hmm. of of the DHA. We, we got to spend the whole episode talking about that for sure. But this this is how these preformed nutrients. Uh, vitamin A is another example. Our body can take beta carotene from plants 
and you can eat it all day long and it's never toxic, will never be toxic. An animal will take that same beta carotene and turn it into vitamin A. When we eat it, it's already pre-converted to vitamin A, which in high levels can be toxic to our liver, mm -hmm. damaging to our cells. And even in extreme cases, lethal. It can kill you. Vitamin A, something our body needs. It's a required right. nutrient. But this is how when you take something from an animal that already has it pre-converted, it's not good for human beings. Whereas you get it from the plant in its, in its precursor state, the body says, great, non-toxic at any dose. I can take this, hold on to it, convert it to the other forms only when and where I need it. And, and that's always one of the main arguments that anti-plant-based people say is that, oh, your body has to convert it. Like, oh no, your poor, awesome. body, your poor <laughs> body has to convert it. And they, they have so little faith in the body. Like, oh, the body doesn't, know how to convert it so we have to just take the preform dha meanwhile like the body is so intelligent i mean it's like so funny that someone with you know can read a book and say oh we can't convert it meanwhile the body has been doing it for so long yeah just like testosterone or thyroid right our body can't convert and make its own testosterone that's bull cocky we know <laughs> that we know that if you take preformed testosterone and put it in the human body, you can actually permanently shut down our body's own process of making its own testosterone. So, so what? Okay, so so let's just in in a short short little brief thing. What what is the harm of these bacteria, cadaverine? Like I know you said they lead to cancer, correct? And the and and what and the TM TMA, which comes from fish, but also from eggs if you eat eggs your body makes this tma now now what's you say, okay so you said the cadaverine and the and, and the putrazine cause are known carcinogens absolutely known but the number one killer of human beings is atherosclerosis so let's go back to that because that's the number one cause of death of human beings on the entire planet mm -hmm. um it's the number one cause of death 50 percent of americans die mm -hmm. from atherosclerosis okay all right. So one out of either you or I, if we were 50 percent, one of us is going to die from atherosclerosis. Fortunately, we're both uh, vegan, so that's that probably not going to happen. But OK, so how is atherosclerosis caused by dietary oxidized cholesterol? All right. Dietary cholesterol only comes from animal products, is not found in any significant amount in plants, period. OK, so the only way you can get that. So this study said, OK, how do we create atherosclerosis in an animal in the lab. They gave uh, oxidized cholesterol and saturated fat to herbivore animals and every single herbivore animal that they tested, 100% of them got atherosclerosis. So the researcher said, not only do every single herbivore, if you feed it uh, saturated fat and cholesterol from animals, you will create 100% of the time, atherosclerosis in any animal that's an herbivore. But it only happens in herbivores. Okay, so this makes sense because carnivores eat meat and never, ever mm. get atherosclerosis. You never see like you never see like lions with heart attacks or strokes. No, it doesn't happen in their kingdom because their thyroid gland actually produces a chemical that prevents that from happening. Mm. Herbivores do not and cannot produce that chemical because they're not supposed to eat that product to begin with. Got okay. it. Okay, so all right. So they, you can actually cause atherosclerosis in a carnivore or an omnivore, a true omnivore. You can cause atherosclerosis if you take out their thyroid gland. Mm. Then they can't produce that wow. chemical and they'll get it 100% of the time, just like herbivores do. So if only herbivores can get atherosclerosis and it's the number one cause of human beings dying, guess what humans are? We're herbivores. Mm -hmm. We have to be herbivores because only herbivores can get atherosclerosis when they wow. eat cholesterol. And cholesterol only comes from animal products. So they said, all right, well, let's let's study that. So they took 4,000, almost 4,000 consecutive autopsies of people from the age of 15 to 85. And they said, 
let's take a look at their and cadavers, even at 15, because they died from an overdose, a, a car accident or gunshot wounds or suicide or whatever. Mm -hmm. All right. So they took all these autopsies, all consecutive autopsies, every one that came in, they tested 4,000 almost or 3,000, I forget, but it was a good number. 100% of the human beings had atherosclerosis, mm -hmm. every single one of them, even the 15 year olds, 100% of those at the age of 15 already had atherosclerosis, the number one cause of death number one cause of heart attack, stroke, uh, high blood pressure, and, and dementia and Alzheimer's. Causal, we know that. What about in a plant, someone who eats exclusively plants? They didn't do, they didn't measure that out. They didn't tease that out. I would have liked to see that because it's not impossible for us to get it. We can get saturated fat and right. we can get trans fats from our foods, which can be just as bad. Uh, we can uh, consume other pro-inflammatory materials. Okay, so they said, and then I get the argument back from some people, well, we produce our own cholesterol. It's not oxidized cholesterol. Mm. You oxidize it as soon as you start cooking that meat. It oxidizes, it binds to oxygen. Then it's got a free radical tied to it, right. which makes it different. That cholesterol becomes a different cholesterol, Your cholesterol number is not as bad as the oxidized, as eating it. Totally. The higher the oxidized LDL cholesterol, mm -hmm. the greater the risk. And it's it's linear. The higher you consume oxidized cholesterol from your diet, which only comes from eating cooked animal flesh, that's the only place you can get it. Okay. So we got this far and they said, yes, but usually that won't, the body can eliminate it or, or break it down unless there's pro-inflammatory substances. Okay. There's a lots of place to get pro-inflammatory substances, even from plants. But remember what plants have, polyphenols and antioxidants and fiber butyrates, all three anti-inflammatory. Mm. So if you're eating a high plant-based diet, you're not getting that inflammation from it. Now, if you're eating a bunch of junk food, yeah, you're probably causing some pro-inflammation. But what is the number one most inflammatory molecule in the human body? Arachidonic acid. Mm. It's an omega-6. Now, they used to think, oh, if you eat a bunch of plant-based oil, you're right. going to get high arachidonic acid because there's right. omega-6, right? Well, they found you can eat nine times as much uh, omega-6 in, in your diet, or even 16 times, there is a 0% change in arachidonic acid wow. in the body. So, so uh, the arachidonic acid is like DHA, but it's from the... So our bodies take omega-6s and convert it into arachidonic acid. But if you eat things like chicken, you get already, you get the preformed pre arachidonic, arachidonic acid. acid. Plants so, do not make arachidonic acid at right. all. It's impossible. Just like they don't make cholesterol. Wow. So now you've got the two things, the actual cause of the placking, cholesterol, LD, oxidized LDL cholesterol, and the match that lights that inflammation, arachidonic acid, both only coming from animal products. You've got the pro the most pro-inflammatory substance on the planet. <laughs> and it's preformed in animal products. Remember, especially if you stress the animal, mm. it's going to increase it. If you harm the animal, mm. if you damage the animal, if you starve the animal, all of those increase it. So now you've got this way amount of huge abundant from uh, from animal farming factory farming mm -hmm. this plethora of cholesterol and mm -hmm. arachidonic acid and it's the exact two ingredients you need to create heart attack strokes and, wow. in the human body that's amazing and, and there it is it's it's the food folks well, these diseases don't just show up out of nowhere. We're <laughs> making them happen. What we put into the body. <laughs> Obviously. Well, that we're almost at an hour, but I want to I want to touch on one more thing that's uh, that that about this operating system that's different, and that is serotonin production. Mm -hmm. So serotonin. You sent me that meme, right? Like serotonin makes us feel good. Uh, I, I'll put the meme up on the video. Like serotonin makes us feel good. Uh, probiotics are in our body, produce serotonin, 
um, right? We get, uh, they, they feed on, uh, on fiber. Fiber comes from plants. Therefore, plants make me feel good. So serotonin makes us feel happy. Yeah, now serotonin does a, a whole bunch of different stuff in the human body. Um, and a lot of people don't know this. Um, uh, serotonin affects our mood, obviously. It's our feel good. Uh, it affects sleep. So we sleep better when we have better serotonin levels. Uh, it calms us down. So if we get stressed, it makes us feel calmer. It aids in our digestion, uh, wound healing, bone health. Uh, blood clotting, sexual desire is based on serotonin. Uh, even our bladder control is serotonin. <laughs> so wow. it's like it's so many incontinence is generally, I mean, if you go on a serotonin drug, you're going to interfere in your own body's production of serotonin, which lowers it, which means you have less for your body to use. And one of the side effects of antidepressants, SSRIs, is bladder control <laughs> stay near a bathroom so it's like okay instead you could just feed your body plants the plants polyphenols and the fiber both feed that and the fructooligosaccharides all these polysaccharides that are naturally occurring in plants all feed the things we've now found even b vitamins can actually are potentially prebiotics uh, for that. So we're finding that our bacteria are eating a lot more stuff than we thought, <laughs> but predominantly from plants, our good bacteria do anyway, and including those that uh, uh, feed, uh, that produce 70% of our serotons produced in our gut. Uh, they take the 5-hydroxytryptophan uh, 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 and then convert it into 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is uh, the proper name for serotonin. Uh, and then it is, some of it is uh, created in our brainstem, but the vast majority of it is created right in our gut. So in our, in our brainstem, is it produced by bacteria also? Uh, no, it's produced by uh, endogenous systems. And Okay, in so we make, but, but so we make most of it, the bacteria make most of it in our gut. And does it, from the gut, does it, does it travel to the rest of the body? It's able to reach the brain and, and, and get through it? Yeah, so, so the, the brainstem one is a backup system. It's a thing to help keep homeostasis. So our body says, hey, look, you're producing serotonin. We don't need to produce any. But let's just have a backup supply just in case you switch your diet or you go hungry for a while. Um, so I'm a bodybuilder. And in bodybuilder, we cut down on calorie consumption uh, in order to get lean, right? Mm -hmm. Every bodybuilder who's taken the stage will tell you about the hangries. <laughs> so it's a, a combination of hungry and angry. And that's because you're not feeding the bacteria and they're not producing serotonin. So you literally can't be as happy as you would if you were feeding it carbohydrates, polyphenols, and fiber from plants. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Okay, so and and it also has effects. Uh, oh, so you're saying it has effects on everything, but including our mood, and that's and that's um and that's not produced if you're eating carnivore. If you're eating meat, you're not going to pre the bacteria are not going to be able to produce the serotonin. You'd have to rely on your own on your brainstem or to produce it. You're saying. So our body will is 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 very clever at having multiple backup systems, but just like putting a donut tire on your car right. is probably not the best thing to do if you want to drive around on a regular basis. <laughs> it's a backup. Just like uh, if we don't get enough carbohydrates or glucose, our body can make uh, different forms of fuel for us. But that fuel meant to be temporary until right. you can find better foods. <laughs> right. <laughs> So our body does have amazing backup systems and ways to try to compensate and adapt for almost anything we throw at it. That's brilliant, but it's a backup system. Don't make it your predominant system. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like these low carbers are doing, they're using a backup fuel, right, to uh, to try to run their systems, and that backup fuel can actually damage and scarify heart tissue. We're going to see a lot of problems, I think, right? Like oh, the keto so. diets are about 15. I mean, they got really popularized less than 10 years ago. And now people are pushing the carnivore. Um, do you expect to see a lot of 
health issues like popping up like really soon? Oh, totally. I mean, there, there's a friend of mine just had a person with uh, scurvy. Mm -hmm. That disease was erratic <laughs> even hundreds of years ago. <laughs> And it's because they're not getting enough vitamin C. There's very little vitamin C in meat. And when you cook it, there's almost none. Right. So unless you're eating raw meat and organ meats like raw liver, you're there's almost no way to get sufficient vitamin C. Human beings, unlike most herbivores, don't produce our own vitamin C. Right. A lot of herbivores produce their own vitamin C. Carnivores can produce their own vitamin C. We chose not to because we're eating so much vitamin C in our plant-based diets. We don't right. need to produce our own. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, you look at that and then you look at a carnivore diet, which has almost no vitamin C, has almost no glucose whatsoever. 25% of your entire energy intake is fed directly to the brain in the form of glucose. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to starve the brain of its main fuel source? Why would you I mean, want they, to starve they, they, the muscle of its main fuel source? I mean, they seem to be able to sustain it for a few years so far. You know, there's people who are, even though a lot of them walk it back and they're starting to include other things in their diet, you know, but this idea that, could only eat meat. It's 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 kind of a new thing that people started doing. Zero fiber, zero polyphenols, almost no glucose, Crazy. Uh, uh, just almost no vitamin C. I mean, fiber is our is a heavy part of our immune system. Mm -hmm. You take that away, well, vitamin C is a backup for that. You mm -hmm. take that away too, you're just. <laughs> asking you're just like hey come on in pathogens i'm free <laughs> you know wow. take over do as much damage you want i have zero protection <laughs> it's shameful it's sad that people are going to go have to learn the hard way they're going to have to learn by creating disease states mm -hmm. uh, and i i really pray and hope that, that that these people don't do permanent damage to their system when i saw that um that thing about uh Oh, what is what is the backup fuel supply that people are talking ketones, about? Ketones, ketones. Ketones, right. So they measured ketones in the heart because the heart is constantly moving. It's the most active muscle in the human body other than the tongue if you talk a lot. But uh, but anyway, so the heart is constantly using energy and it, it can use ketones, but they found, they looked at heart cells that were on ketones for a prolonged period of time. And what happens is uh, they become less efficient at producing energy because it's less efficient than using glycolysis to produce ATP, which is the energy to run the cells. So what happens, it starts closing down uh, mitochondria. Well, mitochondria, we know more mitochondria in the cell means longer lifespan, means healthier cells. And when you start closing them down because there's just not enough energy for the ketones to supply to run those things, then the cell itself apoptizes, but something really bad happens there. The body says, well, if I don't have enough energy even to fill that heart cell, I'm not going to replace it with a new one because it's going to require more energy and there's not enough energy supply from the ketone. So let's replace it with fiber mm -hmm. just to hold the space. Wow. That's scar tissue. And now you have more and more of those start to happening and you get fibrotic scar tissue all over the has heart. That been, has that been studied between ketogenic it diets? Yes. I, was, I was under the impression when I was, when, I was, when I was like talked into the keto diet that our heart and our brain actually prefer ketones. Short term. Short term. Short term. Right. Long term, it cannot su sustain itself well on it and will actually start shutting down cells, shutting down our longevity principles, shutting down our ability to process. Mm -hmm. So the scarification of the heart, that's that's just setting yourself up for a heart attack. It's replacing healthy tissues with dead tissues. It's necrotic. It's you're zombifying your heart the one thing that keeps you alive i'm like why would people do this to themselves they think well, there's, there's better eat. ways to lose weight just they think, it's gonna help them. Much. they think they get to eat all the butter they want and lose weight it's like a they think it's like a win-win for them and <laughs>
and they're they're you know it's it's like giving an infant a loaded gun to play with. Uh, they don't know what they're doing because they don't understand human physiology. They haven't read the research, mm -hmm. and they're just waiting for the damage. These are called silent killers. You know, atherosclerosis can take forty years to shut down the brain or the heart, uh, mm -hmm. but it starts start. They found atherosclerosis in eight and nine year olds. So when when you <laughs> When you start eating, when you if you get off of, of all the animal products and start eating the healthy fiber and polyphenol, you, does it actually start to reverse? It does. You can reverse diabetes. You can reverse atherosclerotic plaques. Dr. Dean Ornish showed that a plant-based diet with other factors, sleeping well, uh, drinking clean water, fresh air, that sort of thing, but mainly dietarily, <laughs> The main contribution was a plant, uh, a low-fat plant-based diet. The plaques actually started to melt, dissolve, and move away. It's you're giving the body time enough to heal and repair itself. If so that's you great news. that steady stream of oxidized cholesterol and arachidonic acid, it's inflammation and, and packing, inflammation, packing, and inflate. And that's why at 40 years of that, you'll finally shut down the arteries and you'll cause strokes, heart attacks, et cetera. So it's not too late. Anyone listening, if you have been eating carnivore or just a bad diet with a lot of processed meats, and you can actually, you could, if you start right now, you can start to reverse that more and more. Diabetes, type two diabetes is by and large reversible unless there's some rare you know, genetic situation. Same with this, uh, this uh, atherosclerosis the vast majority of it is reversible through diet and lifestyle changes. You can take back control of this to stop believing the lies and eat the plants. Mm -hmm. That's what where our physiology is designed for, just like every other herbivore on this planet. And we can live, the genetics show us that our average lifespan, average, should be 120 years, about 117 for men, 120 for women. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. So that should be our average. Our average lifespan is for men just dropped in the last five years by two years. So we're down to 74 years lifespan when our average lifespan genetically has us going to 120. Wow. And but, living well into 120, not, not exactly. You know, 100 exactly. years old and fully functioning to yeah. 120. Right, right. <laughs> Well, awesome, Jeff. Thank you so much for your time. This has been wonderful. I can't wait to do the next one, but we can we can talk forever. But you, I think this was great. I feel like you really got to talk about some things that I don't know anybody talking about, you know, this way and like putting it together with the whole, you know, the bigger picture of it. So well, when, when you see the pieces of the puzzle come together like this, you see how our symbiotic relationship with our microbiome and the plants Mm -hmm. are just beautiful you add in regular physical exercise and some sunlight mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful thing it's a, it's know, a wonderful it's so beautiful. experience <laughs> and we just want to share it we're just trying to share it and you know and and um it's not like we're it's it's i mean we do care about the animals obviously and but it's just the it's just the beauty we like first at least see the beauty of how it all fits together this 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 uh, you know it doesn't have to be so complicated like where you can't lose the weight or you lose it and you gain it back and like this, this just covers it all. And it's, uh, it's fun. It's delicious. It's compassionate. It, it's, it's so super cool. So better, for thank the, you, better for the environment. Thank you. Oh, Thanks yeah. for having me. <laughs> I'll see you soon. All right.